In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Happy Reformation Day, 493 years ago today. A crazy little German monk who had had enough posted a little theological debate on the Wittenberg door. He directed us to St. Paul. He was an Augustinian monk, and he said, Augustine led me to Paul, and then I was done with Augustine. What St. Paul is saying here is that Jesus has forgiven you of all of your sins, even he has forgiven you all of your good works. Now, before you get out the tar and feathers, let me talk to you a little bit about this for a minute, and maybe we'll come to an agreement by the end of this sermon. Have you ever noticed that Jesus always had a soft spot in his heart for the sinners? The righteous people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the experts of the law, Jesus didn't have a whole lot of time for them. They were irritating to Jesus because they had all their good works to hold up. But you remember last week we had a gospel lesson, the publican, the tax collector, and the Pharisee. The Pharisee stood up and said, Oh God, I thank you I'm not like that person and that person and that person and that person. And the publican came and he said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus made it clear that he preferred the prayer of the tax collector, who was a dirty, rotten thief, by the way, as were all tax collectors. The world and the church are full of Pharisees. The world looks in at the church and mocks us. So many out there today won't come into this place because of what they've seen and heard on TV and the radio. Pastors who would dare to step up into the pulpit and say, I'm so righteous I can't remember the last time that I sinned. I agree. I can't remember the last time that I sinned either because I do it so willingly and without any thought. I can't remember the last time that I sinned, but it was probably during the singing of A Mighty Fortress or maybe since I've been in the pulpit here. This kind of theology of glory, of personal glorification, of personal power, of personal piety and righteousness will never do, will it? This is the theology that says, well, at least I'm not like that person over there. I would never do that. These people stand tall, and they think that their job is to make people live a more righteous life. People need to follow the Ten Commandments so that we can usher in the kingdom of God. If you just straighten up, then we would have a Christian nation again. Not so much. Little do they know that in their keeping of the law, they are a stench in the nostrils of God. What's worse is that we in the church, we get all turned into ourselves also, just like these guys, right? It's not right for us to look out there and say those Pharisees out there when we've got plenty in here and there's a big fat one right here in the pulpit right now. We are all Pharisees. We're all turned in on ourselves. We're all trying to muster up some good works that we can show God and say, look at what a good boy or girl I am, right? Isaiah has some word about our good works like that. Works that will never impress God. He says in Isaiah 64, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. You see, even in our piety, we've cleaned up the holy word of God. We're a little too righteous to look into Idah Beged, the filthy rag. It's literally a minstrel rag. That's what Isaiah is saying. I'm a bloody, rotten, stinking, filthy rag before God. And so are my works. See, even in our false piety, we have to clean up the Bible. Don't get me started on St. Paul and Scubala and other words in the Bible. Isaiah even says worse than this. The Bible is offensive. And mostly it's offensive to our false piety. We are all given to this sort of religious delusion. We do something that we think 
would be so good and we hold up our so-called good works in God's face as if we have something to be so proud of. This is religion. This is not the Christian life. The Christian life is summed up in two things, death and resurrection. In Christ, we die to ourselves We die to our lust, to our pride, to our sinful natures, to that control that we think that we have over God's creation, but in turn, it controls us. This is all laid to rest through the waters of holy baptism. Oh, sure, we still get carried away with all of our our pharisaical nonsense, but the difference is now, in spite of our ridiculous behavior that demands our eternal death, Christ is standing between us and judgment, and he declares us, not guilty. He took that punishment. He paid the price. When we learn of the kindness of our God, we learn to hate our sin all the more. How can I continue to live such a terrible life in the face of the one who knows and sees all of my sins and in spite of that, laid down his life in my stead? Yet even as a dog returns to his vomit, time and time again we return to our pet sins. We who are in Christ, how can we continue to live such a lie? We certainly deserve to be punished. We can't deliver ourselves. We're hopeless and helpless. We have to be forgiven. We have to be delivered, and so God did exactly that, as he is the judge and the one judged for us on the cross of Christ. He laid up his life for us 2,000 years ago, and that promise stands for us today. In him, and only for his sake, we are now found, found blameless and perfect in God's sight. Now when God sees us, he delights in us even more than a parent delights in his little child. I have my little dog, Rufus, and he just warms my heart. Times about a billion would be a child. Times infinity is the way that God sees you. He is delighted in you for the sake of Jesus Christ. He sees you through the eyes of love and joy. You are the apple of his eye. See, isn't that interesting that we're sinners and saints at the same time? A friend of mine who's a tremendous Calvinist scholar who's quite popular, written a few books, and he said, to be a Lutheran, you have to be comfortable with paradox, don't you? I said, yes, you do. Paradox, a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses truth. And so is the Lutheran Christian faith. And so we are indeed sinners and saints at the same time. It doesn't make much sense, but we are. Even as we sin, God is delighted in us, not because of our sin, that demands God's horror, but rather we are the apple of his eye because we are his dear children and he is our dear father. Even now as Christians, we are forgiven of our so-called good works. We get all turned in on ourselves, and we get to thinking that we're living a worthy life, as though God is going to be pleased by something that I'm doing or not doing. And so, as God's little children, we hold up our good works in the face of God, and we say, look at what I did. And he looks at us and says, my little fella made a poopy. That's about the way that God sees it all. Our righteousness is only Christ's righteousness credited to our accounts. We are sweet in his eyes because we are his. And yet our works that we think so highly of are nothing more than dung behind, before the whole all-righteous God. It's easy for a preacher to call sinners to repentance. It would be easy for me to look out at you as I have before and said, cut that out. And sometimes we need to hear those words. But the gospel, that's the foreign thing. 
That salvation from outside of us that comes to us, that's the intruder. That's the one that we don't get naturally. Every religion says, cut that out. But Christ, and in him, we hear that as forgiven. It's easy for me to tell you stop abusing each other and stop cheating on your spouse and stop stealing and stop gossiping and all the rest. We've covered that one before. But we realize that there's absolutely nothing good apart from Christ Jesus in or about us. I have to thank Jimmy for shoving Johann Gerhard in my face recently. I found this jewel of a quote from his writings. Our own righteousness, which appears to be righteous in our eyes, is merely unrighteousness when it is compared with your divine righteousness. A lamp is noticed when it shines in the darkness, but it is obscured when it is enveloped by the rays of the sun. Oftentimes, a stick is regarded as straight if it is not held to a ruler. Yet, if it is compared to the ruler, one may then discover that the stick has crooked spots. Oftentimes, the image of a seal will appear perfect to the naked eye. Nevertheless, the eye of the maker discerns many imperfections. Oftentimes, therefore, a thing which shines in the estimation of the one doing it is foul in the direction of the judgment or discretion of the judge. Rather, the first is the judgment of man. The second is the judgment of God. And then Gerhard continues and he concludes this writing. He says, my sins are persuasive so that my heart ought to be accused by God. But your passion in my stead is more persuasive so that I will be defended. My unrighteous life is powerful enough that I ought to be damned. But your righteous life is more powerful so that I am going to be saved. I appeal from the throne of justice to the throne of mercy in order that I may not come into condemnation that I greatly deserve. This is on account of your most holy merit which has been placed between your condemnation and myself. The glorious paradox in this whole thing is that on one hand the Lord saves us from our notions of our merits and our good works And yet we are a new creation recreated unto good works. The only thing that makes any of our good works good is that God is the one doing the work and the one who believes. For those who believe, James is right. We have good works. It flows naturally from the forgiven heart. Here's the problem. We probably won't even notice our good works when we're in the midst of them. And we should pray that the Lord forgives us of our good works so that we don't taint them in the midst of everything. See, we pray the Lord forgives us of our good works if we're the ones doing it. Yet if he's the one doing it, we glory in Christ. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. So we affirm St. Paul today. And we confess that we are all sinful. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We also confess that our good works apart from Christ are nothing more than a steaming dung heap. Yet we confess all the more boldly our Savior, who in his loving kindness has redeemed lost and hopeless sinners. If you have any hope to be used by God as a tool, confess your sins with Gerhard and me and rejoice all the more in your Savior, Jesus Christ who has claimed you as his own, and who surely will use you as you are each his favorite tool in his toolbox of the church. May his grace, his peace, his mercy be so abundantly upon you that it flows over into and onto your neighbor, and may you not even notice it when it happens, so that God will be truly glorified. So there you have it. Jesus saves you from your good works, yet unto good works. Go in his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.